Coming up on Influencing Entrepreneurs. We really wanted Raising Smart Girls to be a place for them to come to, one, for awareness, right? The, we knew that we needed to first educate people. It became clear that the support systems for a young girl before age 12 are very critical to whether she has the right exposure. She's not driving herself anywhere. She's not buying any things for herself. So if someone in her life is not doing that work, it's not going to happen. This season of Influencing Entrepreneurs is brought to you by the Entrepreneurs Organization of Charlotte and Spherical Media. After years of teaching entrepreneurship and consulting business owners, I realized that true knowledge comes from the wins and losses of those entrepreneurs. These are the stories of those business leaders. I'm Kazmer Ward, and this is Influencing Entrepreneurs. Well, Abby, thank you for joining us today. Tell us about uh, Smart Girls HQ. So Smart Girls HQ is a social enterprise that's focused on STEM career literacy for young girls. And by STEM career literacy, what I literally mean is that when girls get to about the age when they start to lean away from STEM, so research says that's about age 12, um, a lot of times is because they don't they haven't had enough experiences with STEM, which is science, technology, engineering, and math, to even know that they want to explore further. So for us, literacy means that they're more intelligent decision makers once they get to that point. They understand what the diverse opportunities that exist in STEM are and what their best fit could be. Um, and, and they realize that there's no running away from STEM in the economy that they're essentially going to be working in in the future. So I, I want to talk about your, your mission yeah. of, of getting um, girls involved with STEM, but yeah. let's real quick, something you said earlier, social enterprise. Yes. Okay. So a lot of people right off the bat, myself included, think right off the bat, that means non-for-profit. Yeah. What, what does social enterprise mean to you? So for me, a social enterprise means a company that has a double bottom line, meaning we care to be sustainably profitably uh, profitable, and it really is a commercial um, venture in a normal for-profit sense. But also our second bottom line matters equally, which is the social impact that our work has. How does that differ? Does, do, do operations change? Uh, fundraising change? No, not essentially. Um, yes and no. So the business runs as a for-profit. We have a business model, right? So we're interested in revenue. We're interested in profits. But at the same time, we also care about how many girls we're reaching, how we're doing that, um, the content that we're building, the impact it's having. And so where it really comes into play is in decision-making. So there is no point where we will make the decision of revenue at all costs um, without considering the impact. And we will also not do it the other way and say impact at all costs without considering the fact that we still need revenue to be a sustainable business. So both things kind of play hand in hand. Where the difference might be is in fundraising, for example, you have impact investors. Um, they will probably be most interested in what we have to um, do. Um, investors that don't care about impact they may have different goals. The goals just might not be aligned, right? So we want to make a decision. They're looking straight at revenue, profits, and exiting the business in five to seven years. Um, an impact investor might have a longer time frame. They might be looking more at seven to 10 years because we have, we're making sure that we're we're having those two bottom lines um, uh, mature over time. So with those impact investors, you're looking like for eventually to sell off the organization, the curriculum, the IP yeah. from there. So an impact investor, when I mean it, what I mean by impact investor would be an investor that would come in just like any other venture capital list, but they also um, care about the, the impact our business will have. So if a venture capitalist was going to write a $1 million check to a traditional nonprofit company, an uh, impact investor would do the exact same thing. The, the only difference is that our goals are aligned. So our impact investor, when they come in and maybe do a review, um, where we are with revenue aligns with where they think we should be um, because they're also looking at the impact we, we're having versus like a traditional VC might say, well, I see that you're reaching a million kids, but I wish you also had $10 million in revenue at the same time, right? Like 
Well, yes, but, you know, it might take us a little bit longer to get there, but do you see how both things um, go hand in hand? In terms of exiting, we would exit exactly the same way, right? Because it is a commercial product, what we do sell, and I can talk about that a little bit more. Um, because we, we do have a regular business model, it could be absorbed into another company the way that an acquisition would work, or another company could purchase it just normally. Where we would think twice is who's the right buyer for this, who also cares about this continuing to be a social enterprise. Making sure that you stay aligned with your double bottom line, both making that having a social impact and be uh, and generate revenue. I'm sure there's often times where it, there's conflict between the two. Yeah. What are some of the examples that you've had to deal with and find solutions to to resolve con that conflict? Yeah, so sometimes the conflict is um, not parallel, right? Like it's sequential in the sense that um, we feel like it's important, and I'll give a, a specific example, but to just set it up. Sometimes we feel like it's important to take on a partnership where we might not, it might not be lucrative in the very beginning, but we think that by doing that partnership, it allows us to do a lot more down the line that, that will bring in revenue or bring an investment or allows, allows us to prove out a concept. So a very specific example, when I first started a company in 2018, we didn't even have products yet, right? So our, our main idea was that um, we needed to support caregivers, so parents and um, teachers and educators, in order to understand the best way to engage young girls, right? So when we did research and we're like, why is this and why is this? And it boiled down to, well, age 12. And we're like, well, what's age 12? Age 12 is is fifth grade. <laughs> what's happening before fifth grade? Nothing, nothing. No career education is happening before fifth grade. Um, and so it became clear that the support systems for a young girl before age 12 are very critical to whether she has the right exposure. She's not driving herself anywhere. She's not buying any things for herself. So if someone in her life is not doing that work, it's not gonna happen. So we started this media property as a resource for caregivers, which parents or grandparents or mentors, educators. Um, and we really wanted Raising Smart Girls to be a place for them to come to, one, for awareness, right? The, we knew that we needed to first educate people um, to understand that there are things you can do that are more engaging um, when it comes to teaching STEM, especially in informal spaces, which is where it comes alive, right? Um, and then once that awareness was there, how do they navigate what's available, right? How do they find things? How do they find camps? How do they find um, the resources and toys and, and things that could support their children? Um, so we really wanted to be that partner. That was where we started. Um, so in our minds- So that the, came before Smart Girls. That So that actually was the very beginning, okay. even before. The company was called um, Smart Girls HQ from the beginning, just um, from a, a business organization right. standpoint. But the only brand we had was Raising Smart Girls. That was the only product right. that we had. So we were actually only known as Raising Smart Girls. Um, and at that time, the business model was that we would, um, you know, make money from advertising or sponsorships um, with companies. So as we started to do that, one of the things we learned right off the bat from um, parents they the awareness part cut on right away was like oh my gosh i get it okay so what do i do and we're like well here's what you do and they're like no 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 like what can is, I, what is he, that here is yeah it, it was or? no for so for us it uh -huh. was just well here we found all the great stuff uh -huh. um and they were like no 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 like can i give you my child okay. <laughs> you can do the things with right. them i was like oh wait no you mean like you don't actually have time to do these things so that's where product started for us as we stepped back and we thought we're hearing too many parents saying like, wait, I need like step one, step two, step three, right? What is my plan? What is my curriculum? Not just like, I see all the things you're showing me, but like, where do I start? And, and that and was quick, where This is came actually, from. it's very interesting because this is, you know, when, with the social media, the TikTok yeah. And, yeah. and everybody trying to um, monetize. Yeah. You know, we were just yeah. talking about that earlier. Yeah. The uh, where you really just started out is you were a knowledge base yeah. online that people yeah. could find out everything, 
hopefully you make some advertising yeah, revenue. That was what we thought was the problem to solve. It right. was like, well, what if we just made it easier for parents? Because I, you know, as a parent, I remember having these websites when I was pregnant, like baby center. That was sort of what was in my head. It was like, what if we could be baby center right. for, you know, STEM education, the, the intercession of um, parenting and education for girls. That was the plan. Um, and so immediately it was clear that um, not only was that not going to be enough, um, it just the the actual type of content that we were preaching that girls needed didn't actually exist, um, at least not in abundance, not even rel not even close. So maybe one a few th a few things, a few brands that started to do some things that were girl focused. So um, in the STEM right education the bat, space, you were finding it everywhere else. Yeah, and, and we're like, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so um, we knew that there was a need for a curriculum. Um, and not just any curriculum, because there's a lot of curriculum out there, but a curriculum that will work at home, um, that would take into consideration the parent's need and the caregiver's need, as well as the child. Um, so in that sense, we were looking at two customers. We knew that the learner, the child, needed to have um, a project and activity that was engaging, something that was really fun, something that was also hard enough, a challenge enough, but fun enough so that they learn um, a, a concrete idea about a career that they could potentially have in the future, but they, they do it in such a fun way that they want to do it again. Um, and then we knew for the parent that they didn't have a ton of time. So this had to fit in a specific time frame. It had to have different modes of engagement, meaning like, if I don't have time, can my child do this unsupervised? Which meant for us, are we gonna have video guides in addition to the way we even design our instructional guides for these um, activities? Can they be um, uh, individually led by the child, right? So there was a lot of thinking that came into, how do we design a product that's gonna work well for a super busy parent as well as um, learn a child that's like STEM stuff is boring. But that, that team is probably completely different. So being yeah. the knowledge base is, as yes. opposed to creating, how did you start building that so team that, out? So that brings me to um, you know your original question that brought me to that, which was how do we how do we balance the idea that some things uh, are at conflict when it comes to impact and revenue? So the way that we started to go about it was we looked for a partner school. So my prior life, I was a product manager and I was leading um, a global product organization and had a huge portfolio of products. And what was drilled inside of me in that professional experience is how important it is to live inside the heads and the space of your potential customer. So I knew we needed to find our way to be in a school or in some sort of environment that allowed us to interact with kids the age we want to serve um, often enough that we can learn and observe and see what they like, what they don't like. We were already doing that with parents. We were raising smart girls. We were hearing from parents all the time, but we were missing the learner piece. So this was a point where, you know, we had an awesome opportunity to partner with a school. Schools don't have any money. So the decision was, are we going to do this knowing that we're going to fund this ourselves? Um, I'm going to bring a team. And and because this is something we want to learn from, we have to, this is not even like, oh, take the least of our resources and we'll just do this thing. Like we have to go all out right. <laughs> and give them the best of the best. Um, have Which this amazing you're not experience. Generate exactly. revenue, if not, and we're profit. not. Yeah. Exactly. And we already know we're going into this knowing that we're not going to generate revenue. Um, so what we did was, well, let's test that sponsor model um, right now. We don't need it to generate profit, but can we find um, companies that care about this enough to join us in that year, that pilot year that we had designed? And luckily we did. So we found several companies that helped us along the way. The very first year we sponsored it ourselves. We've done this um, a couple of years now. Um, the second year, um, the first year we, we got halfway sponsored. The second year we got fully sponsored. And now, you know, we have, we always have some help, but we're always eager. We're always happy to, to do it as well because it, it's sort of our lab now. Um, but that for us, that experience gave us lots of data, lots of experiences that allowed us to actually build an actual product, allowed us to have proof points to get fundraising later. Um, and so even though it was something that didn't generate revenue up front, paid 
tons of dividends much later. So that's one way to think about how those things can be a conflict, but um, moving around it. In terms of product development, absolutely, completely different team. But the beautiful thing about being a startup is that it, it was a team of one and a half already. Anyway, so it was like, yeah. oh, we're just wearing new hats now. Um, I had product experience already, so that 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 wasn't um, a big deal. It was actually fun to think about. Um, but we worked with lots of different contractors. Um, we typically go out to experts and you know pay for their time to consult with with us for a short period of time. Um, but my team even now is still relatively small. I have one other full-time employee and a few part-time employees and then contractors that work with us. Um, but yeah, transitioning the team from, um, from being a content team to a product team, um, hasn't been drastically different because our product is still content. It's just packaged differently. Was there a fear doing that first project for free? And yeah. I, even though it was a test that you could end up having to go the nonprofit route or that, that we can't do this for free. Yeah. <laughs> so yes, that what, I don't know that it was a fear. It was sort of a, I have no idea where this is going to go. Um, but I know that we have to do this like that. I was, there was a hundred percent sure that what we would learn would be completely valuable. Um, also I, you know, the impact side of the work that we we're doing that gave us an opportunity to do that. So we were getting fulfilled just doing it because this is why we wanted to do this. We could see, I mean, um, our whole hypothesis was that if you could connect with girls over a longer period of time, so cons consistent, positive experiences. And here we had, we were with 20 opportunities during the school year to connect with an entire class of fifth grade girls. Um, so we were, we were testing out our hypotheses, which made us super happy. So, um, I, I felt like I would say in the very beginning, when I took the leap to do this work, my backup plan was, well, if this doesn't work, we'll turn into a nonprofit and I'll go back to work. Thanks for watching and stay tuned for part two of this episode. Influencing Entrepreneurs is brought to you by the Entrepreneurs Organization of Charlotte and Spherical Media. Be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash or visit casmerward.com.